Hello, risk participant. Welcome to the first meeting of Rethinking Eurasia Lecture Series 2020. How are you today? Hope you are feeling well. My name is Ajimas, and I'm going to be the moderator of today's talk. Before starting the session, I'd like to remind you all, participant, to change to rename your username as in instructor in the chat box. Also, don't forget to mute your microphone during the session. Accept when the when you answering the lecture question. Today we are delighted to have Dr. Evi Eliana from Universitas Negeri Malang, who will be discussing about socially constructing Eurasia an introduction. Before we start the lecture, I like to give a brief introduction about Dr. Evi. Dr. Evi Eliana is a lecturer at the Department of English, Universitas Negeri Malang. She obtained her PhD in Asian Studies from the Australian National University in 2019. She has done quite she has done quite an extensive research and publication in gender, cultural and gender studies. Her latest publication on gender and Indonesian cinema can be accessed in internationally reputable journal such as Social Sciences, International Journal on Indonesia Studies and Situation, Cultural Studies in ASEAN Context. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Evi Eliana to deliver the talk on Social Constructing Eurasia and Introduction to Dr. Evi Eliana. The time is yours. The time is yours. Thanks, Ajimas. Uh, I just first I'd like to check whether my connection is good or not. Can you hear me well, everyone? Is um, my voice smoothly transferred to you or not? Yes? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Because previously, somebody told me that it was like, you know, the noise, there is noise and everything. And then the breaking up of the, uh, what is it? The, the, the network and stuff. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, well, Sorry about the sad movie, but yeah, it just to trigger your curiosity and also to link back to the opening of the session about the meeting point there in the short film you saw, uh, you watched uh, someone from the UK, like a UK native and an Asian native. And this Asian man is a migrant in the UK and he has little English and he wants to express himself, but he is unable to do so. He wants to, um, what is it? He wants to show that he's sorry, but he cannot do that because he's lacking and everything. So it's it has a lot to do what, to what we are going to have this, um, this month and next about Asia and Europe. It's about identity and how the identity is, um, you know, uh, facing challenges, how we uh, see ourselves as Asian, or maybe if some of you are Europeans, um, some international students are joining, um, you know, the, how we see ourselves, how we define ourselves as Asian, who set this definition. Okay, now allow me to, allow me to share screen of my lecture. Um, there. Wait a minute. Let's start from the beginning. So my lecture is titled Socially Constructing Eurasia. As we said that Eurasia here is not only about race, but we are talking about Europe and Asia and the connection between both. Because these days people travel so freely. Okay, so it's not like, you know, Europe is very far away. Okay, you can go to um, Amsterdam within hours. And of course, with the advance of technology, we can connect with people from say Berlin or from the UK, okay? Like in an instant, okay? So we need to think about whether we are really that distant, whether we are really that different, how the traffic of people and the traffic of culture, how the traffic of entertainment industry has already changed the way we think about ourselves as Asians and Europeans. So today is the very basic 
um, you can say like theoretical framework in the way we understand Asia, Asians, and Europe, and also Europeans. So first, I know that you love playing games. So let's do this game. I know for a fact, I'm going to call on someone, okay, to finish my sentence. I know for a fact that Indonesians are. So I take it that Indonesia here is an example of Asia. Okay, get ready for someone that I'm gonna call, huh? Who was the winner, who was the winner of the previous uh, quiz? Komati, who was the winner? Can, can you, can Anissa you name Rahma. one winner of the previous quiz, huh? Anissa Rohma. Anissa, okay. Anissa, can you finish my sentence? I know for a fact that Indonesians are... Anissa, are you with us? Three, two, one, ah, out. Alhan, Muhammad Alhan. Your name is on my screen. <laughs> That's very easy of me to call on you. Alhan, now finish my sentence. I know for a fact that Indonesians are. The biggest archipelago country in the I world. I said Indonesians, not Indonesia. Are unique? I know for a fact that Indonesians are unique. Now, I, I want to know what, what do you mean by unique? Uh, because it consists of many people from many countries and we have many uh, like In people. In what that, way that uh, are Indonesians unique? We have uh, dozens of languages. The native languages of Are Indonesia. you talking about Indonesia or Indonesians? My question is, I know for a fact that Indonesians, the people. Are kind? Kind. Okay. Now, Jesti Susanto, do you agree that Indonesians are kind? Uh, yes, I think that Indonesians are kind. Why? Just because, because you are Indonesian? Yes, Indonesian. Yes. Okay. Now, next person I'm going to call on to finish my sentence. Thank you, um, Alhan and Jesti. Is Rina. Katarina. Katarina Tri. I know for a fact that Indonesians are. I know for a fact that Indonesians are always care about other people's business? Nosy? Yeah, kinda. Why do you think so? Well, Are you not Indonesian? Are you proud of that? I, I, no, I'm not proud, but that's the fact, I think, because when we, we, we as Indonesian, we have to consider a lot of things before we act. So, because if we don't act the way that people act, they will talk about us, like something like that. Thank you, Katarina. Okay, now what we were discussing just now about, I know for a fact that Indonesians are, do you think that we were born, like Indonesians are born to be nosy or Indonesians are born to be unique, to be kind or are we culturally constructed or socially constructed to be that way okay now let's have a look now after Indonesia I'm going to take you to Japan okay I'm gonna stop there but I guess that you get the you know um, you get the idea of the video okay sorry you get the idea about beauty in Japan Maybe we share the idea of beauty, okay? But the question is, has the idea of beauty been like that for ages or not? Okay, so this is something like, you know, the two things about Indonesia and Japan and the idea of beauty in Japan are to trigger our intellectual work about 
whether the idea of beauty is like that for ages and it has never changed and whether the idea of beauty in Indonesia and Japan are the same. Okay. So now get back to the business. The core business is social constructionism. So social constructionism is a theoretical framework. Okay, for those who are doing um, social sciences, you might be familiar with it and you might want to use this as a framework when you're doing your thesis. And this um, framework basically questions on how a social reality comes into being. What is a social reality? When people tell you that, hey, you're so pretty, that's maybe not necessarily an essence, that there is an essence of beauty, but this is a social construction that we agree that such kind of feature is called beautiful or other kinds are less beautiful. So we, with this uh, framework, we can question whether a certain social um, reality is historically or culturally specific, okay? Maybe it's not like if you're from uh, mathematics, for example, one plus one, okay, this is two. That's like fixed, right? But when we ask people about, okay, what's your idea of beauty? Maybe we can have like more than 10 types of answers. And maybe among Indonesians, especially the youths these days who watch extensive um, Korean uh, drama or Korean pop culture, they will have pretty much the same idea about beauty, all right? So the social reality may vary in the perspectives of people across culture and across history, just like the standard of beauty is a social reality. And then with social constructionism, it allows us to ask who said it, who established it? Is it even only one way to be beautiful or handsome? Or do we understand beauty the same way across cultures and history? It's not like one plus one equals two. People from Australia to North, um, you know, North America, people will agree about one plus one equals two. But with social reality, we might have different answers and we can have thousands of them. Lotus feet is another example of social reality regarding beauty. Back in the day, in the 10 up to, um, you know, 10 to 20th century in China, foot binding was very popular, especially among the upper classes because they showed, you know, foot binding is a symbol of, uh, you know, that you are not working in the field. You don't have to go to the uh, field to plow, to plant, okay? So this is a symbol of class for women and also a symbol of beauty. But then if it is applied today, it will be considered as violence against women, all right? Like also the, the culture of corset in Europe, for example, Back in the day, during the Victorian era, corset, wearing corset is like part of becoming beautiful. But these days, only few people who would wear corset, okay? And the kind of corset that people are familiar today is different from those from the Elizabethan and also Victorian era, okay? Because our ideas of beauty, our ideas of social reality, the way we understand the world, especially in terms of social reality, keeps changing, okay? There's nothing that stays the same, all right? So when I say, okay, now say hi to Mr. Park Bogum. So when I say I know for a fact that Mr. Park Bogum is super handsome, I refer, to, I, I am aware that his beauty is a social reality. And the way we understand handsomeness is historically and culturally specific. What does that mean? Okay. This kind of beauty may not be appreciated the same way three decades ago in the 80s, especially after the conclusion of uh, Vietnam War, 
you know, Rambo, and then, um, you know, the, the, the character in the Terminator, you know, the, the men who are muscular, and then they're macho, are the symbol of masculinity. But these days, Art Bogum has already, you know, replaced this idea of beauty. Okay. Many girls would go dating Park Bogum rather than, you know, someone like Sylvester Stallone. Now, you tell me. <laughs> right, now, social constructionism is a theoretical framework which allows us to question how a physical quality that is represented by Park Bogum becomes a standard of beauty for men these days. Many men aspire to be like him and many women want to date guys like him, okay? argue against me if it is not true. Okay. So oh, we may say, I know for a fact that Germany is a developed country and Indonesia is a developing that are based on certain standards set up and agreed upon by certain interest groups. Okay. There are people behind these categories and these people have their own interest in setting up these categories, okay? People who think that Park Bogum is handsome, they have interest in doing so because they want Park Bogum to sell, all right? Okay, now the standards may champion certain countries and subordinate others in the context of developed and developing, uh, you know, categories, okay? so. When we are talking about social realities and the way we understand them, we always talk about unevenness, inequalities. Because when we, for example, if you are Javanese, this is my experience of becoming Javanese. Javanese is like the number one ethnic group, all right? So I grew up with the idea like this. Okay, when um, a child is not, uh, treating their parents well, he or she will be called as Gajowo. Okay, so not Java. So he's not Java. As if like this bad quality doesn't belong to Java and then Javanese people would uh, have the right to, you know, eliminate this person with bad quality as not being Javanese being Javanese, okay. So the standard of becoming Javanese or becoming uh, developed or developing countries always uh, put someone or something at the top of the hierarchy and then there are people at the subordinate hierarchy. That's how language works, okay. And we cannot take for granted the process of knowledge production about these categories and how the knowledge is sustained through social actions. What does it mean, social actions? Our, you know, our, uh, what is, our, when we talk to people, this is like social actions and also the institutionalization of certain ideas, say for example, um, you know, marriage, for example. Marriage is a formal union. If you're not married, then you are not, um, your relationship, your romantic relationship is not desirable and la la la. And then uh, marriage is institutionalized um, in law and then there is a uh, regulation about marriage which uh, subordinates other types of relationship which is not married, marriage, okay? Or the type of marriage, certain marriage is more acceptable while others are not, okay? So this is how we uh, understand social reality. This is how we understand or understand the world, how the working of the world, okay? So we make meaning. As humans, we have the capacity of language and language allows us to make meaning. And apparently meanings are not always neutral, okay? So now, social constructionism. Social constructionism appeared uh, in the 19th and uh, about 20th century, and it is now still very, uh, you know, glorified at the moment. So it answers the uh, lack, or no, or maybe it challenges, not, not lacks. It challenges the medi medieval thoughts, which, um, you know, 
six for truth, uh, the medieval uh, thoughts between fifth and 16th century, quite centered on the role of religious institutions such as church and distancing individual person not affiliated to church from discovering the truth. So when people would like to uh, discover truth or to find truth, to find um, the meaning of life, the meaning of any social reality, they, go, they went to church. They believed that church um, had all the answers or religion had all the answers. And then uh, it changed in the 17th and 18th century during the Enlightenment period. Uh, during the Enlightenment period, um, you know, people started to acknowledge the, the role of individual person in the search for objective, objective truth. Nah. Here, uh, people tend to do like, you know, experimental research. Um, they uh, try to find true nature of reality using reason and rationality, and they still seek for the truth. So people think like the truth is out there. But in the post enlightenment period in which social constructionism belongs to, there comes like, you know, there is a post structuralism way of thinking, a school of thoughts which rejects singular truth, as I mentioned about beauty, beauty in Japan, beauty in Indonesia. Say for example, in Indonesia these days, you will be called beautiful if you are wearing hijab, for example. And every time um, someone converts from not wearing hijab to wearing hijab, she would likely get the, um, you know, congratulation. Hey, congratulations! Semoga aman, semoga apa, apa konsisten atau istiqomah. Okay, uh, hopefully you're consistent in this way, and you look more beautiful. Okay, so but this kind of way of defining beauty may be different in the United States, in Europe, in North Africa. Okay, because you know the truth about beauty is multiple. Okay. So social reality is not about singular truth. Social reality is multiple, uh, you know, multiple ways of making meaning of it. And then it rejects the underlying monolithic structure lurking beneath the surface of the world. Okay, so because it rejects singular truth, um, you know, it tends to question that things happen incidentally. Okay, things are not happening incidentally. There's a process to it, and the rejection of belief in a right way of in a right way of doing things. I'm going back to my um, example of beauty. Okay, there is not only one way to make you beautiful. Okay, certain makeup, you know, applying makeup is not the only way of being beautiful. Not wearing makeup is even a new beauty trend these days. Now, getting back to the theory, in that sense, um, I'm going to use Vivian Burr uh, formulation of social constructionism, which has four core idea. The first is questioning objective truth, which means it, uh, if you are a social constructionist, you uh, take critical stance towards taken for granted knowledge. You also um, take a stand that uh, you, you also believe that our observations of the world are never free from biases. So that's why I put this uh, picture. Okay. It's like we are the blind, uh, you know, the blind men and women there trying to observe. An elephant. Some of us might uh, touch the elephant's ears and say, "This is a fan," or elephant the elephant's body. Oh, it seems like a wall. Okay. Oh, or eleven the elephant's tail and say, "Oh, this is a rope," or "This is a tree," or "This is a snake." Okay. So we're obs actually observing the same social reality but we have different way of seeing this. Are we right? Are we wrong? Okay, so the question is not about right or wrong. 
So the question is our vantage point from where we stand when we see that social reality. The second is um, historical and cultural specificity. Question of the uniqueness, uniqueness to history and uniqueness to culture. They are specified to particular cultures and periods of history. They are seen as products of that culture and history and are dependent upon particular social and economic arrangements prevailing in that culture at that time. For example, when we talk about good music, what is good music? <coughs> Do we understand good music today the same way as the people in the 80s? Now we speak in this language. Um, about the previous one, sorry. Uh, not that one. About music. Now let's talk about music. When I was younger, this kind of music was like, you know, only for old people. We and to uh, think that this kind of music is uh, for old people, but also for people in um, villages. So this, is, this is considered as good music. People enjoy it uh, not only in villages. So you, if, you know, I don't know if any of you have put that, this made the decompot has made a lot of concerts. And the young people of Indonesia are really, really into it. Okay. In my, when I was younger, when I was younger and prettier, um, what was cool dick was uh, like, it's in the box, it's like, something like that. these days, maybe one direction. But the second version is only uh, no, not as popular compared to I compared to this life in my time when I was younger in the nineties and also in the early two thousand. Was that was a big thing? Okay, but one direction, even that it's big, but it wasn't as big as Westlife and also um, voice, right? But these days, you know, as um, you know, BTS is much a big star, and then Blackpink, okay, and competing with the market, okay. So, if you want to find, is there one way of becoming Asians? Is there one way of becoming Indonesians, and Malaysians, becoming Koreans, becoming um, Belgians, becoming um, the Netherlands, okay? I'll say there are many ways of finding it. Okay, and those nations are related specific, right? Now, and the knowledge is sustained through social uh, processes. Okay, what kind of social processes? You know, when people interact, and then we make meaning. When people when we watch films, we interact with the right or maybe offered to us. We don't necessarily agree with the meanings offered to us. We do a dialogue. Okay. And this kind of social process at one point would uh, sustain the money, or we say the most dominant and you know, consider okay. And some of the time, it will be a debate. That's why, when the film, the controversial film, Billy was released, it was followed by a debate. We are trying to, uh, you know, we're trying, we're battling for me. Some people agree that um, the film is not a, uh, is to mean women, but some others may agree with that, okay? I wrote about this uh, at Indonesia, and you can um, follow the link there, and then um, read how I sort of contextualize this debate about battling for about gender, about 
feminism, even about how we talk about film, all right, in the context of uh, what is it, gender order crisis. Hello. I'm not going to play the film because it's we're running out of time. The fourth, knowledge and social action go together. Each that are invited a different kind of actions from human beings. For example, theft is considered as criminalization and it will lead to prison. And then marriage, it will lead to people congratulating you. And then if you're joined, people will feel good about you. That's at least what happened to Indonesia. And maybe if you're a Jomblo, you're one of those things like the age of 35 in Indonesia, the reactions can be from killing people, Lulu and Jodo. Or I'm going to introduce you to someone. Okay. So each different social construction, for example, about being single, about being married, you know, they lead to certain social action. And then, so if we have to characterize social constructionism, we can prove that social constructionism is essence. This is an anti-essentialism framework of thinking. Okay, is there any essence of becoming beauty? There is essence that everyone should agree that there is a way of being beautiful, but it's not. It's also anti-realism, which means that it opposes one way of making meaning of social reality. And it's historically and culturally specific. Uh, it believes in historical, historical and cultural specificity of any knowledge. Knowledge here, not only knowledge of uh, IPA, as knowledge here means like, you know, social reality, what we believe in. And then language is a precondition for thought. So we make meaning because we have the capacity of language. Without language, we are unable to make meaning. And language is a form of social action. We can only use this when we interact with people in, in, in a social interaction, including with ourselves, because sometimes we think that ourselves is another person. A focus on interaction and social practices. I mentioned that um, knowledge is sustained through social practices. And focus on processes. Excuse Nothing me, baby. Incidental here. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the voice is not stable. Yeah. Your voice sometimes is very not clear at all. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Uh, I think it's the internet, Pa Amri. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 the problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you anyway. I was trying. Thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. uh, now, but social constructionism is not without issue. There are some questions that we can discuss further. Where do the specificities, where do the specificities and and commonalities begin? Because if we say that it is very unique, the unique, do we have even something in common with other cultures, right? And for example, in the case of gender, where does biology and social construction begin? And then, so let's generate some conclusions together before I wrap it up. What I mentioned from what I discussed during the lecture, let's finish the sentence. No, I never backed that. Now, you can finish the sentence. I'm going to call on someone. The ways in which we see Asia and Europe as well as the respective cultures of people, maybe I can call, I can call on. No? Okay. 
Hello, is everyone sleeping? Yes, yeah. Hello, Dimas. Dimas, can you copy? Excuse me. Hello? Um, your voice wasn't very clear. Okay. I'm and sorry. I think I need to change. So I'm going to stop there and then let's go to question and answer. I'm going to change my, uh, my connection now. Try. Wait. Wi Fi. No, it's okay now. Hello. Is my voice okay now? No, yes, I think it's, it's a bit better. better. Yeah, it's better. Is it better? Yes, okay. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so basically when we, def we, when we define what is it to become Asia, what is it to become Europe, okay, we are talking about social construction and we can find, we can um, get like multiple answers, hundreds of answers, all right? So, okay, I'm waiting, now I'm um, giving it over to Ajimas and then let's have a more interactive session. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Thank you to Dr. Eliana for the insightful talk. Now we are going to have Q&A session. I'd like to welcome any questions or comments pertaining to the talk on the chat room. Yeah, you can raise your hand and send it in the chat room. Any question? Any hands raised? Okay, Ibu Effie. Yep. The first, the first question is, what do what would the world like look like if beauty standard didn't exist? Would it would it be better or not? From whom? Um, Me. sorry. Do I? I think it's too far for searching in the okay. comment. Okay. Because it's too yep. many comments. Yep. Sorry. This is in the area of imagination, just like uh, the song. Okay. Imagine if there's no religion, then what would happen? Okay. And then if there is no standard of beauty, what would happen? There will be other standards because we have a language. Language operates through, for example, labeling. Okay. When we label, this is nice. The meaning is, you know, you can find opposite meaning. Of course, I'm not talking about like one-to-one -one relation. Like if it is not nice, then um, there is nice. Okay. There is, this is like a spectrum of meaning. Okay. All right. So there is no standard of beauty. I believe that there will be other standards. Okay. Will it be better? Hmm, I don't know. How do you imagine it? It depends on how you imagine it. Isn't it even bad now with standard of beauty? Isn't it about 
you know, the way we see is the standard of beauty itself. Yeah. Next question. Okay, the next question is, do you think that beauty standards are constructive from Putri Wandasari? Who's that? Oh, okay. Uh, beauty standard is a, so is a social construction? Definitely, yes. Beauty standard is a social construction. We may disagree on the beauty standard of Putri Indonesia, for example, which said rain, beauty. Well, what's the three B? Rain, beauty, and then what's the other one? <laughs> I can't even remember. Okay. Behavior? Behavior. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Rain, beauty, behavior. Are these the only thing that matter? Okay. Are there, are there any other things that matter? Okay, we can disagree about this. Okay, of course, because this is a social construction. And then um, some people with certain interests legitimize uh, this social construction, make it uh, to cement it. Okay, and then people agree with that. And then, um, you know, this kind of beauty pageant is replicated over and over again, and then throughout the world, okay, so that people believe that, you know, this is the standard of you. If you have brain behavior and then, um, what is it, brain beauty behavior, okay, then you're beautiful. Okay, next question. Thank you for the answer, Wafi. The next question from Nur Afifa Rustan. I would like to ask a question about LGBT. What do you think of that issue? Is social construct constructivism a part of that issue? This is a big issue. And um, it involves a lot of things when we see LGBT. So it's not only about whether a, uh, someone who is gay or a lesbian is a socially constructed identity, you know, they're becoming a lesbian or gay is a socially constructed identity or something like that. So even the debate is not over yet. So there's no conclusive debate about what makes someone a lesbian or what makes someone gay. All right. So of course, there are a lot of social constructions about it. Even we as heteronormative people, the way we see the LGBT people is because we are privileged of becoming heteronormative, okay, becoming the norm, all right, in the society, sometimes we discriminate against them because we see that, um, you know, we treat them unfairly as if like, you know, they're less human, okay, let's acknowledge it, okay, there are a lot of gay bashing in Indonesia. It's not all reported on the news, okay? How did it happen? It happened because the way the heteronormative people see the people who do not conform to the heteronormative arrangement as lacking or needing discipline. Okay. Is there a bad way to think about that? I mean, you know, ask yourself, when we, um, you know, when we interact with other people, we are required to be equally treating them equally and you know fairly. But why we act differently towards certain types of people? Because we are socially constructed, for example, to see that we're different, and then sometimes some of us problematize this difference. Okay. We do not take this difference as diversity that we have to respect, but we take it as, oh, this is our job to discipline. That's why, okay, there are facilities to make gay people straight again, okay, or, you know, like people consider that, you know, the gay people need disciplining, and then um, it leads to violence, all right, but the key is actually when we understand it as social construction and we return to the idea that we are equally human, we have to respect each other. Right. Okay, next, please. Okay, thank you, Wafi. And next question from Nandia 
Nanda Widya Muharram. When the when we are talking talking about standard and social perspective, what is the process of forming the concept of crime? Can can the concept of crime, which is used in law and scientific literature, be considered objective? Sorry, clan. Crime. Oh, okay. Crime. Crime. Sorry. I, I didn't get that. So when we're talking about the standard and social perspective, what is the reason uh, of forming the concept of crime and can the concept of crime, which is used in laws and scientific literature, be considered objective? Um, this is a very interesting question. All right. Crime, the concept of crime is uh, formulated based on whether somebody committed an act that puts disadvantage to other people, all right? And they're trying to make a, what is it, like universal, but still this is a social construction, like the idea of the concept of theft, for example, you steal, which is, you steal something, like one steal something uh, from other, um, someone else's belonging, all right? Okay, it puts advantage to the one who actually possesses it. Okay, but then, even though that we agreed that this social construction is, because social construction of theft is agreed by many, what we don't agree often is that whether we give um, the same uh, punishment to any theft. Okay, that's why the concept of crime always evolves and the concept of justice always evolves. Okay, and then because the concept of crime and justice is not free from bias. Yeah, next. Thank you, Webby. Next question is from Katarina. From what I got, the, socially, the social constructionism is changed based on the society. What are the factors that make the, the society change it? Is it because the society ways of thinking? Thank you. There are a lot of things that can affect the way society evolves and meaning evolves. For example, pandemic, it has changed a lot of things. It has changed the way we see a lecture. Previously, when a lecturer doesn't come to class, it will be considered as, well, she's, an a, she's AWOL, absent without leave or something. Or, but now you must not attend a class in person, okay? Our normal way of making meaning of class interaction has changed, okay? Econo and then the next thing is economic change. For example, back in 1998, I always tell the story because it affected me a lot. In 1997, 1998, Indonesia and many other um, countries in Asia experienced a massive economic up, uh, downturn, which we call Asia financial crisis. It changed a lot of things in the way we make meaning out of many social realities, including gender, okay? Before that, it was very common for men to become the, uh, what is it, the, the, the breadwinner in the family. It's very normal, it's very normal. If um, a woman worked at that time, they will be considered as secondary to the, uh, you know, secondary earner, despite being, despite earning more than the husband, okay? 1998, my family and many other families got affected. My first business shrunk, like from having, uh, you know, from being able to feed the family to not being able to feed the family at all, okay? And then relying so much on my mother's income, all right? So it changed, the, it sort of triggered change in the way my dad looked at himself as a man. 
And apparently, as I grow older and did research on gender and masculinity, apparently not only my father had experienced that one. A lot of men, especially the class men, okay, have got to be the, you know, the middle income in 1998, okay? And then uh, they had to negotiate how to make meaning of their masculinity. Okay, they can no longer provide for the family or they cannot provide enough for the family so that they have to redefine what is it to become a man? What is it to become masculine man? Okay, so that, you know, it triggered a lot of change. And also what is it to become a woman, of course. All right, so politics, economy, and then social change, a lot of things. Next. Okay, thank you, Wavi. And the next question from Dimas Raditya. If language are one of the most cruci crucial aspects of having social constructionism, what makes some people that speak the same language have different social constructionism and how people who speak with similar language, like for example, Swedish and Danish, would they have an overall different social constructionism? Wonderful, thank you. That's a very critical question. Language is one thing, okay. And then, as I said, vantage point is also crucial, okay. You watch Tilik, the film, the very controversial film, as a woman, as a man, as a middle-class woman, as a middle-class man, as a lower-class woman, as someone from Georgia, you might have a different way uh, of making meaning out of the film, right? Maybe some men would say, oh, that's funny. That's how my wife would act, right? But for some women, maybe, no, 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 okay? This is not the way a woman should be portrayed, all right? We speak the same language, okay? But our vantage point is different. Our education level also, you know, is a factor. And then our class, our religion, okay? So once again, social constructionism is, makes us question whether there is only one way of becoming Asia, Indonesia, a woman, you know, questioning all these social realities. Thanks, next. Next question is from Ibu Susana. What do you think about religious commitment in this era? Oh, Ibu, thank you very much. We can discuss this like further about this. Indonesia has uh, get into an era where, for example, Islamization is at its height. It's very, I can say it's intensifying Islamization, but it is not, it doesn't happen like instantly. It's a process. It's a pretty long process. Um, you know, how we come like this and then how Islam has become a very hegemonic force, okay, after the new order these days. Of course, there are a lot of things, um, you know, this social change has affected people in various ways, okay. As a researcher, I find that, um, you know, there are a lot of things to observe, there are a lot of things to be discussed, okay, and then, what I, find, what I find interesting is that um, the combination between the heightening Islamization and democratization and how this often collides and then, um, but also at the same time sort of, you know, work together. So I find like the social processes in Indonesia are becoming more complex. And then um, it's not like under the authoritarian regime, okay, if you don't agree with the, uh, with the government, with the regime, for example, and then the next day you're missing, okay? But these days, if you don't agree with the government or if you don't agree with the majority Muslim community, then 
you still have outlets to uh, show disagreement. Um, so the combination between Islamization and democratization to me is a very interesting, um, what is it, process to be observed as a researcher. Thanks. Thanks, next. Thank next question is from Sunkun Zansu. Mm -hmm. Why most Indonesians are Indocentric rather than being a global species, like belonging into a global village? Mm. Thank you very much. So we go back to, so we go back to the uh, game earlier in the lecture. I know for a fact that, okay. The game was actually trying to elicit stereotypes. Okay. I don't know whether the word most Indonesians are Indocentric is, to me, it sounds very stereotypical. Do you have data that most Indonesians are Indocentric rather than being a global species? Like how many Indonesians are like that? Okay, like belonging to the global village? Yeah. I, I um, you know, I'm very curious why you think so. Actually, how did this idea get to you? Why, why you think that Indonesians are Indocentric? Okay, are all Indonesian Indocentric? Are you talking about nationalism? Are you talking about, uh, I don't know. This is like a very, uh, you know, sometimes social construction also, uh, creates stereotype when it is very thick, okay? So for example, um, among the white people in the United States, the black people are prone to, prone to committing crime. There's, there's why they're having a lot, a lot of things happening about you know, police shooting and everything in the United States. So what I'd like to point out is that defer your judgment. Okay, when we're talking about social reality, sometimes when we have uh, negative thoughts about a group of people, defer your judgment. Okay, that's why it's very, deferring your judgment is very important because otherwise it's gonna lead to conflicts. Okay, so uh, Sun Kung Danso, uh, it's good to defer your judgment. Next, please. Thank you, Wefi. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Rizka Salasabila. Lately, there is a word toxic masculinity. Are mm -hmm. those the bad impact for beauty standard for men? Mm -hmm. Toxic gender, not only toxic masculinity. Okay, so toxic masculinity uh, can be said, like, you know, this term emerged when um, feminists try to defend the impact of hegemonic, mas hegemonic ideals of becoming masculine actually also took a toll on men. For example, for men being called brave, they have to be able to fight, okay? And some men who were defeated in fights Okay, they're considered as less masculine. Of course, this kind of um, behavior, this kind of attitude toward masculinity is very toxic because it leads you to violence, it leads you to um, intolerance and everything. And uh, yeah, um, that's why we need to label this kind of uh, practice, masculinity practice, so that men will also be aware about uh, what is it that this kind of practice is not necessarily good okay we need the label that this is toxic and you know this shouldn't be this shouldn't be adhered yeah. next thank you Wefi. yeah next question is from nadia karima how much do you how much do you think social constructionism affect stigma, specifically 
around mental health or in general? Right, thank you. A very good question. Oh, I love this discussion. Um, yeah, if we, like if people with, men, with mental health are considered as lacking, uh, considered as uh, less functioning, okay, they will, of course, they will, um, you know, they will be stigmatized, okay. But if the people with mental health issues are constructed in a health uh, framework, for example, as requiring assistance in terms of health, okay, stigma will be able to be, you know, stigma can be avoided, okay. Of course, what happened these days apparently that um, social construction of people with mental health is very much riddled with negative stigmas. And this is something that, um, you know, people uh, are trying to reconstruct or offer a different definition. Okay, for example, students with depression, this is something common or, um, you know, like, we, we need to, we need to, uh, what is it? So that people will be able to come out with their problems if we do not offer a different social construction like what, you know, offered by uh, the warriors of mental health, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard for the ones who suffer mental health and also for the family and the people around them because they will not know what to do other than ostracizing the people with the mental health because maybe, for example, they don't want to be associated with them or maybe they, you know, like they don't want to be part of the problems and everything. Yeah, next. Thank you, Bevy. Mm -hmm. And next question is from Nabila Sinta. You can turn on your microphone. Okay, good afternoon, Ibu. Um, hi. Hi, hello. And I want to ask about, um, there's this, uh, I want to take back the example about beauty standards. Um, in my opinion, like in the beauty pageant and stuff, um, one of the biggest factor of the, of, uh, the social control constructivism is the media that's in my opinion i mean um because of people watching that um the beauty pageant everyone has this uh way of thinking that um the stereotypes of beauty is this and this and for that um how do we break out through that stereotypes because um yeah we because of the media and we consume that every day it's really hard for us to not think of the same, uh, think the same way as the media. Not only the media, the institution of beauty pageant itself is also, uh, yeah, exactly. is very problematic. How can we, how can we uh, fight this? How can we fight this? Of course, it's not easy, but there are women who, uh, you know, advocate for alternative beauty. Like say, for example, these days in the United States, they have already, um, you know, Previously, hair products are only for those uh, whites and or those with, you know, easy, uh, what is it? Easy setting hair, okay, like straight, like Asians. But these days, the African-Americans are very innovative. They also offer uh, alternative beauty products, okay? What we can do is to set examples and if we have power financially, then we create different products, alternative products that champion different type of beauty. Okay. If we can, then we can, we can, you know, take more people to support us. It's not impossible to change, you know, Duff. Yeah. yeah. Duff, tahu kan? Tahu. Okay. Duff sekarang, these days, they use different types of beauty to be their ambassadors. Not only the slim and fair complexion, there are also uh, women of different 
skin color and also different body types. Okay, so if you have power, then let's uh, you know start the change. If you think that you don't have power, maybe you haven't realized that you actually have power. You have access to social media. Okay, you have friends to convince. Okay, we can start from something small. Okay, maybe in your PKM project, you offer something different that champion different types of beauty. Okay, I don't know whether it's a hair product or skin product. I remember back in the day when I returned from overseas, I hardly used, um, you know, whitening cream. Okay, when I got back to Indonesia, I was trying to find cream with no whitening. It was so hard. Like I went to many supermarkets, but it was so hard to find face cream which doesn't have, which didn't have whitening agent in there. And then I was like, two years ago, it wasn't like this. Then what happened with Indonesia? Like only two years, like all racks in the uh, what is it? In the supermarkets were filled with cream with whitening agent because nobody offers something different. Okay, so let's start from something small and now. Thanks. Next, next. Okay. Thank you, Bobby. The next question is from Sharin Keisha. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the body positivity campaign? There are a lot of arguments against it, saying that it may justify obesity and unhealthy body. Mm -hmm. Also, would it be possible for the beauty standard in patients to change? I mean, would it be would it be possible to have plus size patient participants? Okay, um, thank you, Sharon. That's a very good question. Uh, okay, right. Um, this is what we call as battle of discourses. Okay, battle of discourses. There are discourses championing slim beauty. There are other discourses, uh, you know, another discourses crafting it as body positivity, embracing um, your body. But the issue is that health, right? And then you must not feel that you are lacking because you're fat, because, sorry, because you're overweight, okay? But what you need to rethink about your body is whether you are healthy or not, okay? So I guess like sharing what you are, um, you know, now uh, Sharon is uh, mentioning is actually a battle of discourses because people see social realities differently. Some people see like this and some people see like that, okay? So yeah, it is your job to, you know, get into the debate and then make your voice heard. Thank you, Wavi. The next question is from Aulia Rahma. Mm -hmm. He said that, I'm sorry in advance, but is it possible to, to you that re-explain re the characteriz characterization of social contract scenes since okay. it's, it was like you okay. last time before? I'm going to go back to sharing my screen again. Okay, where is it? This one. Okay, so social constructionism, if we characterize social constructionism, it is anti-essentialism. It means that it questions whether a social reality has essence. It doesn't believe in essence. For example, when we talk about beauty, is there any essence in beauty? Okay, of course there's not, it's just that we agree on the concept, okay, certain, you know, this certain criteria is considered beauty and the other one or not, okay. Anti-realism, which means that it believes, it believes in multiple 
social realities and then it, it, it believes in historical and cultural specificity and then language is very central in the meaning making and then uh, social constructionism also focuses on the interaction on social practices that a certain meaning is not does not happen you know instantly and then it is maintained through interaction and social practices and uh, also a focus on processes. I don't think I'm able to re-explain this in more detail because we are constrained by time. But Sharin, uh, sorry, what was that? Uh, who's, who, who was asking? From Aulia Rahma. Yeah, Aulia, you are very much welcome if you want to email me and then just shoot questions. Do we so, still have time? Yes. Okay, next so, question. Okay, next question is from Nur Anissa Haris. Mm -hmm. In what situation may the hierarchy or social structure collapse? Yeah. Is there any chance for it to do so? Yes. No hegemony is fixed. No dominance is fixed. Hegemony happens through social processes which also means that it never stays the same. It is possible for a hegemonic idea to crumble and become subordinate. Believe it or not, back in the, uh, before uh, the 19th century, even like in the 15th century, when the Dutch first came to Indonesia, they were surprised that um, more women were more active in, the, in Indonesian, the Nusantara ports they were the traders. They were very active as traders while men, they stayed at home. But this you know, conception of how becoming masculine men has changed in the 19th century. Okay. Of course, social change doesn't happen instantly. If, you'd, you know, if you dream of changing the way we think of something at the moment and then you start a social movement for example it may not yield it may not yield in an instant um, result okay it may require more than a lifetime yeah thanks thank you baby next question is from Chrisvania putri why is it so important to be masculine for men too i think Flamboyant men can be attractive too. Of course. Okay, that's why social reality, the meaning to social, when you make meaning um, of social realities like beauty, handsomeness, is very much subjective. It is not free from biases. Okay. You can have your own opinion, but is your own is your opinion um, you know a dominant one? If it is not a dominant one then there might be a chance that uh, your idea will be debated by others who hold to dominant views, okay? Say for example, these days, like in this room, for example, in this Zoom room, how many people we have, like 170, 150 now. Uh, I believe that we can have, you know, more than five or 10 ideas of becoming handsome, right? And we can debate this until tomorrow morning. <laughs> right, next. Okay, next question is from Indah Utami. What do you think about the role of power, like political, social, or, or economic, in influencing the social construction of reality? Yes, our identities are layered, okay? I go back to my idea of vantage point. The way we see social reality is uh, very much subjective to our identities. And for example, myself, I'm a woman, I'm a Muslim, I'm a, even, even Muslim, okay, it, becoming a Muslim woman is, can mean a lot of things, right? And then middle class, educated, okay. These identities okay, affect the way we see things, All right? Next. Next question is from, oh, this is, will be the last question okay. from Nadia Karima. Mm -hmm. 
who was social constructionism a fact or different differentiate differentiate view between people from different region or people with different culture Sorry. yeah uh, the way we take social constructionism is that we are very it makes us very critical of what we believe in okay but the idea is that um, you know it also nurtures tolerance that we are different that we may be different but not necessarily that you know one is lacking from the other okay so social constructionism teaches us tolerance social constructionism teaches us to be more critical about what we take for granted as real or truth okay yeah okay well we, it is a uh, one last question is from pa amri mm -hmm. i do agree to the idea that presently identity means many identity means many and the idea of binary opposition mm -hmm. has been criticized yep sure yet why do we still use the simplified binary term white and color okay as i mentioned that you know we're talking in spectrum with language it, we're talking spectrum it's not like you know with post-structuralism, if uh, with social constructionism, social constructionism, which belongs to post-structuralist um, school of thoughts, we see we make meaning meaning in spectrum. Of course, like white is not only with black or colored. Okay, white can also be opposed to Asian. Uh, you know, uh, what is it like? You know, Mexican, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But why binary still prevails? because that's, you know, that's the easiest for people to understand. That's why I have read some research why Islamization in Indonesia, especially those uh, with black and white meaning making methods are very prevalent among Indonesian lower and middle class because it's easy for them to follow, okay? It's not easy for them to follow Quraysh Shihab who will, who will um, you know, give you back the question, okay, return to you with the question, do you, do you think it's right? Or maybe like give you multiple answers to your question. They, um, you know, because people like to think simply. Okay, we are not so accustomed to critical thinking. Okay, so if we drag it further, we are, uh, more accustomed, we can think much more easily in the black and white. Okay, if it is not this one and this one, that's very easy, right? But if we are offered too many choices, then we can often get confused. That's why people tend to choose like the easiest, the easiest part. Okay. Although this world is not only black and white. Okay. okay, thank you to Dr. Evie Eliana for the amazing talk. I'd like to invite all the participants to give a round of applause to our speaker by clicking the reaction button. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such a wonderful discussion. I really love it. So you have to keep up the energy. We have eight more weeks to go with multiple speakers with, um, you know, more interesting ideas. Okay, so yeah, um, enjoy the precious moments and make the most of it. And before I close today's meeting, we will have a photo session. Thanks to all participants and committee. Please turn on your camera so that we could capture all the attendees. Please give your beautiful smile. One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. On scan. One, two, three. Awesome. Thank you. What's All the participants. Yes, you should just announce. What's for next week? Oh. Who are we going to have next week? And what are the topics? 
I guess it will be uh, literacy. Oh yeah. Among Indonesian um, migrant workers, something that you may not be familiar about. Okay, there are a lot of Indonesian migrant workers, especially female, who created YouTube videos. Okay, now try you know you can start googling and then uh, you know follow their video, you know watch their videos and how they express themselves. And the next one, I guess, uh, it was it's going to be Burenzi. Am I right? Yes. We're going to be talking about wartime linguistics, which I find it very fascinating. In the wartime, what kind of language as a code, um, you know, used by uh, those parties involved in war? So, yeah, language can also be a pop culture. Thank you. Yeah, in day two, we have we have the speaker of Dr. Pratiwi and the. Dr. Nurenzia. Okay, thank you for all the participants. I hope you all enjoyed today's session of Redicking Eurasia Lecture Series 2020. Last but not least, I'd like to invite, invite all the participants to follow our social media as stated in the chat room for more information regarding, regarding our upcoming events. And for the real official website, you can Access it in oer.om.ac.id slash reels. So we have come to the end for the today, today meeting. I'm Azimas signing off. Thank you for your wonderful participation and enjoy the rest of Rethinking Eurasia Lecture Series 2020. Bye bye.